Lecture 4, The Capital City, Part 2, The Industrial City. Two of the big themes that we want to keep in mind uh, when looking at this material. The first is the ongoing discussion of the role played by effective visualizations of graphic analysis to tell a story that can really bring to life uh, an idea and actually have an impact in the world. Uh, so check out, uh, keep that in mind moving forward through this material. The other larger theme is the debate uh, between uh, different types of negative things that happen in the world. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, there are deliberate evil acts uh, performed by, perpetrated by criminals uh, at various scales. At the other end of the spectrum, we dismiss certain bad things that happen as acts of God or acts of nature or freaks of nature. Uh, and you can think of global warming as one of those. Uh, but in between, there is a vast territory uh, that increasingly with increasing clarity is where most things fall. And uh, Hannah Arendt, when she was famously writing about uh, the trials of Eichmann after World War II on trial in The Hague for crimes against humanity uh, during the Holocaust in World War II, she came up with this term called the banality of evil uh, to characterize the sense that what really uh, happens more often than not is that we tolerate negative things. Uh, we accept them as normal. And this uh, puts a profound uh, weight and burden on notions of normal uh, because pointing out just how significantly uh, the tolerance for the suffering of others plays a role in the events of history. And the industrial city is actually a great example of our capacity as a society to tolerate the suffering of others, to dismiss it as natural somehow. And this word natural is a very important word um, in the study of history, uh, that things are rendered as being natural that are, are not at all natural. They are completely man-made and tolerated. Which brings us to London uh, during, uh, before the, the Industrial Revolution. And here we see a romantic vision of London. So what is being emphasized here in this illustration? Uh, look at where the dark is, uh, and this is a clue as to how to do visual analysis effectively. Uh, this is a vision of London as a place, uh, a city of Christianity, uh, the Tower of St. Paul's by Sir Christopher Wren, we looked at um, in the previous part, uh, but all the other church spires that dominate this view of London, and the elevated view turns out to be the key one with architectural human scale, experiential space in the foreground and the larger system of the this urban fabric in the background. Um, the rise of industrialism, uh, and here's a very similar method of rendering. Uh, you see the original drawing, uh, by the way, I do not recommend using drawings as the basis for analysis, but um, in this case, the illustration is itself a useful uh, analysis. Uh, we see the emphasize, emphasis on the church steeples in the original drawing, but also the emergence of smokestacks as the industrial city starts to make its way imprint on the landscape along with the infrastructure of the rail system. Uh, and increasingly, uh, the Industrial Revolution comes about uh, through the convergence of at least two different, th let's say three different factors. For centuries prior to the invention of these great machines, uh, the laws of enclosure in England were gradually pushing uh, peasant farmers off the lands that they had traditionally 
uh, worked and cultivated for centuries. Uh, it was the uh, operation of the common, uh, the commons, uh, where if you worked, if you lived on and worked on a piece of property, you had certain rights to the produce of that labor. Uh, land ownership was not a, a big factor. It was all owned by the king or the feudal and governed by the feudal lord, the local um, power structure. But ownership, fee simple ownership as we know it, was not uh, a, a major part of the system. It was actually much closer to what the First Nations of North America operated uh, under uh, in terms of uh, the alien idea of land ownership, that uh, if you work the land, that was how you get rights. The laws of enclosure over the course of several centuries, uh, from uh, the 14th century onward, uh, gradually became more and more forceful as a force for pushing these peasant farmers off of the commons uh, and the increasing privatization of property rights and land ownership. Uh, and great uh, hordes, masses of people were displaced off the land in sudden uh, legislation uh, that pushed peasants into uh, villages, towns, and cities that were forming for the first time. Uh, in uh, 1850, London was the first city uh, and England was the first large society that uh, resulted in 50% of the population living in an urban context. And the laws of enclosure were a major push off of the land. Uh, pushing off the land is an extremely uh, negative and harmful thing that we continue to see today, especially in China. Um, and the themes of the industrial city, looking back in history, are often applied to contemporary conditions in China. The other force was the technological change. And here you see the water, um, the location of water, as you can't see the water. It's not emphasized in this one. But water power turned out to be the crucial um, game-changing technology. And here you can see in the city of Lawrence, Massachusetts, where the Merrimack River drops precipitously, a canal that cuts through uh, horizontally uh, along the top two thirds of the screen here. The canal brought water from the upper level of the river and allowed it to uh, race down through the factories down to the river and drain. And the weight of the water, uh, the physics of this, drove the machinery of the Industrial Revolution. And so the Industrial Revolution was a, uh, an extremely powerful force for attracting. So that was a pull, a very positive pull force into urban settlements to uh, drive the factory system. Uh, because of the transportation technology of the time and the cost of rail tickets, even where rail existed as it came to exist, uh, people needed to work uh, close to where they live, that is live close to where they work resulting in extremely high densities. The third factor, which uh, is difficult to trace in the visual analysis, is the global network of colonial uh, domination that uh, supplied these machineries in Europe uh, with the raw materials uh, that drove these factories. Um, during this process, uh, London became uh, London starting out from a position of a series of estates, each owned by um, important nobles. Uh, these estates, each of them became increasingly urbanized uh, with the layout of blocks and streets. This is from 1723, uh, the process of urbanization of London. Remember, they're heading for a 50% urbanized population, the first place to achieve that. The world achieved that in the year 2010. Uh, globally, one half of the population of the world is now living in urban conditions. Um, here you see the layout pattern of blocks and streets with inner courts. Uh, this was uh, one of the important aspects of all of these topics, is the relationship between light and air, as we saw in the cholera epidemic, uh, 
uh, battling the cholera ec epidemic. The relationship between windows, rooms, unit layouts, and building layouts, and building layouts to the form of the city. There's a very important uh, relationship between those distinct scales one to the other. And here we see the layout of uh, Grovesner Park, uh, part of the um, Grovesner Estate uh, in the section that is now um, uh, referred to as Mayfair, London, near Hyde Park, one of the most famous uh, areas of downtown London. And this layout uh, allowed uh, large populations to form on the former estates of London. And each estate was developed in this way with a what became a residential square at the center. Uh, originally, the manor house would be on that square. And so it was an ev a very clear evolution from agricultural lands, which you can see uh, where it's labeled Berkeley Farms or something like that, um, Berkeley Fields, um, the evolution from agricultural usages to uh, urban, the urbanization resulting in these kinds of uh, residential squares that became the famous uh, DNA of London, a very uh, distinctive and not very common uh, urban formation. Um, and here's a mapping. Uh, you see, you'll recognize um, the, 19, the 1666 uh, fire map of Hollar uh, superimposed with uh, development since uh, a listing the yellows are the uh, residential squares that correspond with what used to be the great estates of London. And so that structure continues to the present day, as you can see in formations like this. The um, people who live on the square have access to the park. Often they are locked gates with uh, only limited access to that recreational space. Um, we've see, we see that in Boston, in uh, Beacon Hill, that the British uh, model was uh, transplanted to the colonies. Um, here we see a view of the wider urbanization pattern of London, which is, again, is a familiar pattern that was translated uh, to New York City that we'll, we'll see later. Uh, but the back alleys where uh, the mews, where the poor people used to live now, uh, some of the most coveted real estate, ironically, in New York are the mews uh, because it's a way to escape the uh, trauma of traffic and cars. But the conditions in London uh, were not great. And the reading uh, for this week uh, is, a, is a documentation of what happened, the kind of conditions that developed in these uh, situations of extreme high density without proper consideration of, uh, of hygiene and the infrastructure to deal with sewage. Um, the Friedrich Engels uh, was a young uh, son of a wealthy factory owner, and his father thought it would be good for young Friedrich to get to know the ropes. Um, and so he went off to uh, have a job in the factories overseen. And uh, an interesting thing happened. Uh, the conditions, the working conditions were one thing, but he dared to ask questions and start to uh, look at and document the physical spatial arrangements of the living conditions uh, set in the city of Manchester. And his a uh, friend and co-author, Karl Marx, and he basically um, wrote uh, a great deal about uh, the operation of capitalism. Um, the two great uh, threads uh, of, this, of this period were the writings of Adam Smith and the writings of Marx and Engels. And it resulted in uh, the setting up of the competition of the 20th century between uh, socialism and capitalism, uh, the, a struggle that continues to the present, 
uh, but was largely settled in the late 20th century in favor of capitalism. This was all set up um, by this literature. Adam Smith was writing from a position of great abstraction when he was writing about the magic of the invisible hand of market forces. Um, Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx were very much writing from the physical reality on the ground, uh, the oppressive conditions tolerated and made, made natural by the laws of capitalism. Uh, Pugin uh, used the, the vision uh, of the old city and the new city uh, as, an, as a moral allegory. He used, uh, again, an elevated eye, point, eye view uh, to see uh, an architectural, spatial, experiential foreground, the larger uh, urban manifestation of the systems in the back. And uh, the top image, we're, we see the, a romantic version of history where the walled city of Christendom uh, and the landscape, the open countryside, has decayed and been taken over by the evils uh, of um, of industrial development with the smokestacks replacing the cheap, the, the, the steeples, uh, the penitentiary in the foreground, uh, panopticon penitentiary, uh, and the poorhouse, uh, a, port a very dire portrayal of progress, so-called. Uh, painting, again, plays a role. We saw this in Paris, uh, here in, in London we see a um, romantic vision of the light streaming down on what is a fairly uh, negative uh, landscape of the industrial city, the polluted rivers, the smoke, the soot, uh, the rail system raised over the, the houses on the viaducts uh, would deposit a, a layer of soot on everything um, here portrayed in a very similar way. Notice the arches of the raised viaduct, the rail, uh, the cramped conditions are a common theme in the painting. Um, the, these engravings by uh, Doré uh, showing uh, the very bleak conditions, the, the white clothing laid out to dry. People read about the, uh, they would turn gray uh, with the coal dust um, before the, the clothing even had a chance to dry. But the extremely high densities uh, required by the walking distance uh, of uh, workers in relationship to their factories. And again, another portrayal um, with the viaduct as a framing element, the river, the factories, the, 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 the smoke of the industrial production. Uh, and the inner courts uh, that Engels writes about uh, is here uh, illustrated by Doré, uh, the overseer with his whip, uh, the oppressive conditions, uh, overcrowding, uh, very much um, a, a big uh, moral issue uh, of the time, uh, very much along the lines of the banality of evil. Uh, uh, the argument being made, how can we tolerate? This is not natural. We can do things. And so here's a diagram uh, showing uh, the efforts, il illustrating the efforts of a, a commission in 1845, one year after the publication of Engels' writing about this system, um, showing how densely populated uh, the arrangements uh, between where people sleep and where they um, throw their garbage and where they do their um, personal business. Um, this brings us to the illustration by Edward Tufte. Uh, I'm not going to go into this, uh, but you could pause here and see if you can figure out what is being communicated here. Um, this is one of Tufte's favorite uh, illustrations uh, showing Napoleon's march on Moscow and uh, the fate of, of Napoleon's troops. Um, in a similar vein, this is one of the uh, stories that Tufty likes to tell. Uh, this is a diagram based on um, Dr. John Snow's 1854 map. The big question, again, uh, building on what we saw in the Paris, uh, was cholera. Uh, 
cholera was uh, uh, not like global warming in that it would hit and there was no debate about whether it was real or not. Uh, tens of thousands of people would die at a time. Uh, and it often affected not just the poor people, but also the wealthy people. Uh, so there, they, there, it's not something that could be tolerated, uh, getting back to that theme. And so uh, the dominant theory at the time, which had a profound impact on housing arrangements, was that cholera was spread through the air. That if you could smell things, uh, you, you uh, were exposing yourself to the contagion of cholera. In 1858, the great stink uh, of the Thames River, the uh, parliament could not hold its uh, session because of the smells. They soaked the curtains in lime to reduce it, but nothing helped. Uh, but there was, it wasn't just a, the nuisance of the smell, it was a profound fear that uh, they would all uh, take ill and die uh, because of the smell. And thus the housing, the importance of the the courtyard, uh, having a window on every room, being able to open windows uh, to let the air uh, cross ventilation was important. Letting sunlight in was a key health concern and continued way beyond, um, to, well, continued to the present, way beyond any consideration of cholera because in 1854, Dr. John Snow, using this type of mapping, uh, this research, this is a great example of design research. You design the visual representation as a way of asking questions. And the uh, precision and the data that is uh, represented in those uh, visual representations become a crucial part of uh, the investigation, the, uh, the discovery, and the production of dependable new knowledge. This is a scientific research act, which is the basis uh, for a lot of themes in architecture of late. Uh, and so here's uh, another version of the map showing the bodies. Uh, when people get ill, uh, they get registered on the map, uh, and you look at the map and, and try to see what you can be learned from it. In a way, this one shows it with greater clarity. Uh, and the the question here, the question being asked by this drawing is, what is the correlation between water sources and cholera deaths? And the uh, results of this became not just uh, a matter of discovery, but also a matter of convincing Parliament uh, to pass legislation. Based on this map, John Snow um, gained the authority to remove the pump handle on the famous, the infamous pump on Broad Street, uh, where was located the, um, the epicenter of the uh, outbreak of cholera. Other mapping tools uh, that came along, um, this is a much more precise uh, exercise here, uh, taken on by John Booth, to locate the um, juxtaposition of wealth and poverty in the physical uh, arrangement of London. And um, so we get these types of maps that do uh, the job of locating open space in the housing and then uh, the concentrations of poverty in specific areas of, of London and according to certain uh, physical layouts of the streets and the, and the buildings. And here you see a clear illustration of what Engels is writing about. Along the main thoroughfares, uh, you see the shops, uh, the housing, um, what we call the, the high, medium, and low bourgeoisie, people with discretionary income, what we would call middle class uh, today. And then hidden away in the inner blocks, the darker areas, are the housing and the conditions of the working poor. Um, we used to call we used to have a category called the working class, um, but it has largely disappeared from the popular press and even social science literature. Um, there is no it's uh, it's a wall. There is no uh, category it seems anymore. Um, but that's what it looks like. These things uh, show up in uh, in Manhattan uh, during the British War of 1812. 
the British uh, took over Manhattan and they, uh, they commissioned this survey uh, that plotted the topography and the natural features, uh, especially for their military um, importance. And then on top of that uh, remarkably detailed uh, illustration, talk about uh, high resolution visualizations, um, the map was three feet tall and nine feet long or longer. Maybe this looks maybe, well, it's three feet tall, so maybe 12 feet long. So it's a remarkably detailed survey. And on top of the survey, the commission of uh, Manhattan uh, laid out the famous Manhattan grid across the entire island, way beyond any anticipated development. Uh, it was in part to control for speculative development, uh, but it was uh, also uh, one of the most profound uh, and profoundly ambitious uh, speculations of future growth ever. Um, and one of the themes that should have been emphasized in the Paris uh, material is that Haussmann's reconstruction of Paris was financed by speculative real estate and deficit spending. Uh, one of the brilliant innovations that one of the several dozen brilliant innovations uh, that Haussmann introduced uh, with that project was deficit spending. Um, they borrowed a huge amount of money uh, and didn't pay it back for decades. Uh, but the, the, those works, uh, the transformation of Paris was not cheap. Uh, but it was paid for by deficit spending. And the uh, Haussmann and his cronies all became um, ridiculously wealthy uh, by having advanced knowledge of where the boulevards were going to be cut and thus where the increased value was going to be. This was an attempt to um, normalize and create equal value across uh, the landscape. Zooming in, we see the early development. Uh, Wall Street was built, uh, is named that because there was a defensive wall uh, during the time of Dutch occupation. Um, and uh, the topography is leveled out uh, as this grid is filled out, um, as development moves north of Wall Street and into the rest of Manhattan. The huge waves of immigration uh, that came, poured into the Port of New York, past the Statue of Liberty, filled uh, the neighborhoods of New York. Uh, here um, in the Lower East Side, the famous uh, bend, a very rare uh, moment. Uh, maybe you can see it here. I don't have a pointer. Um, but the, uh, the photographer Jacob Rees in the late 19th century uh, used his the power of uh, the camera, the elevated uh, eye point view, uh, access into these units, and called for the reform of the living conditions. Uh, you see here the evolution of the rules um, that resulted in different innovations in the design of housing that uh, made it into the legal structure of New York City. Uh, uh, Pre-1850, you see the standard arrangement of shallow housing arrangements with three windows on the front, three windows on the back, uh, two units per floor, and a very large uh, courtyard, except uh, where filled in and the dotted line indicates uh, in A, where a, a rear building uh, was built. They were outlawed after 1850, and the tenement uh, got larger, uh, became four units per floor, uh, now two windows um, for each unit, um, but only on one room of the house. Uh, in 1879, you see the introduction of new laws that require windows uh, on every room, uh, part of this uh, light and air campaign. Uh, not much light in these air shafts around the stairs, uh, but uh, at least the possibility of ventilation. And so you have shared bathrooms. Uh, the, the bathrooms move indoors. Uh, before there had been outhouses in the, in the courtyard alleys. Uh, now uh, shared bathrooms on every floor. Uh, the open kitchen dining room uh, parlor arrangements allow for 
um, access through uh, from the bedroom, through the parlor, through the kitchen dining room, to uh, the windows. Um, you see various alternative plans. It evolves 1887 into the form. Um, I lived in one of these uh, for several years. When I was in architecture school, those air shafts are quite um, nasty. Uh, then uh, you see the evolution through time with uh, increases in the lot widths, uh, allowing for larger uh, air shafts internally in the block, uh, and then onward, uh, something we'll look at in the next part. Uh, and inside these units, uh, piecework, uh, people were paid uh, one cent for every uh, several dozen decorative flowers they produced by hand. Um, they tried to work near the window so they had enough light to, to see. Uh, and so this piecework is what um, the garment industry uh, for most of the early 20th century, how it worked. Uh, the children got involved. They, sleeped, they slept in these units as well. Um, the kitchen sink was also the shower uh, for a long time. Uh, I had the chance to rent uh, places uh, that were still operating that way. They were called cold water flats because there was no hot water. And the, you stood in the kitchen sink uh, under the shower head over it. Um, uh, but that was an improvement on this. Uh, flop houses, uh, depending, you know, for a certain, you know, quarter, you could uh, sleep uh, in a, these hammocks for a few hours. And this entire neighborhood in the Lower East Side of Manhattan um, was once uh, a dense sea of these tenements. And slowly over the years, you see them being replaced uh, by the public housing that will be um, a big part of the next lecture. But the, the final point to make here is to emphasize <clears throat> the importance of the, the scales of these relationships in architecture. You may design a window, <clears throat> but the window itself is, is only of limited importance. Uh, it should be designed in a way where it relates to an open space outside. The quality and scale and arrangement of that open space is crucial. Um, the, it's also related to an interior architectural condition, also a crucial relationship. So the window is simply a threshold between outside and inside. And the design of the outside and the design of the inside are important parts of that window. Uh, and that, in turn, will have a a huge significant impact on the architecture of the unit. And so the arrangement of the units will then in turn, the way they cluster the logic and geometry of its agglomeration will have an impact on the larger uh, architecture of the building. And that in turn has an impact on the arrangement of buildings and blocks and the blocks uh, make up the city. And so uh, often mediated by a grid. So these are the types of relationships that uh, you may ask the question, where does architecture start and end? Um, does it go beyond the scale of the building? Does it go down uh, in scale beyond the level of building to the components of building, the materials of windows, uh, the technologies, uh, building technology? So in a way, we've broken the scales up a bit in the concentrations. But no matter what concentration you're in, uh, architecture, uh, you can try to focus on one scale or another, but architecture will always return us to the more holistic continuum from the molecular level up to the scale of the globe.